Well, it is time for us to get started uh, for, with our Sabbath service on this 13th day of the second month. We are in the 41st year of the 40th Jubilee, based on our reckoning. And we are at the end of the fourth week of the Omer count to Pentecost. Tomorrow starts the fifth week of the count. And uh, Passover in the second month begins with the uh, Lord's Supper tonight. For those of you who are... Uh, in a position where you have to keep the second Passover, now is the time you'd be doing that. I'd like to start services by asking James Daly if he would please open with prayer. James? Uh, thank you. Our Father, Yehovah, give you the appreciation and thanks for allowing us to know and use your name to be part of help making your name known throughout physical Israel, in the northwest of Europe, and throughout the world, among all people. We know that uh, your name has repeatedly been polluted and misused this past uh, 40 jubilees and it's our greatest privilege to help mankind learn and know how to use your name correctly so that as we speak to you it's a, used as a way of proper identification we give you thanks for this we give you thanks for an appreciation for life itself. We appreciate the protection and controlling or watching over our minds so that we can stay true on the, the right way and the correct path so that we can be good examples of your way of life, which we can exhibit through our faith. So we give you thanks for all that, the fact that we've been given life, so strengthen us and help us so that we can be good examples of living your way, the, the way that all men will keep in the millennial period upcoming. We can see that a fairly severe tribulation will come upon all people, all nations throughout the world. So we ask please for your protection that uh, you put it into your mind uh, how we can take action ourselves to, to protect ourselves and those uh, that are aligned with your mind and your way of working that we can be good examples to all the world we need to uh, help and your strength with that and we give you the greatest thanks for the all that you've done for us and most of which we may not even know or appreciate properly so we give you thanks we know that it's a come from you this understanding of your way and this faith that we have in knowing that following your way is uh, paramount so we ask again for your uh, strength and your blessing and give you the greatest appreciation and thanks for life. We ask for all this, please, the authority of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, James. Certainly, uh, our Father in Heaven does many things for us that uh, we probably don't know anything about, never know that he intervenes in our lives in a lot of different ways. So it's uh, something for us to always be thankful for, the fact that, uh, as James mentioned, that we can know his name and we can use his name properly. And that's a, a great blessing because his people are to call upon his name. 
So, if you'll remain standing and take up your hymnals and open up to page 38, on page 38 we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 48, Mount Zion Stands Most Beautiful. Page 38, Mount Zion Stands Most Beautiful for our opening hymn. Okay, that's a good beginning, I think. If you'll now turn over to page 55. On page 55, we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 72. And this is something that we should all be praying for, that uh, Yah would give judgment to the king and to the leaders of this, the nations of the world. Um... Because if he does, then perhaps the plan might change a little. But we don't know, but we're told to pray for them, so we should. Give judgment to the King of Yah on page 55, after which we'll turn the mic over to Mr. Westhead to bring us a weekly news update.
Okay, if you'll take up your handles and stand one more time, we will sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 121, titled, To the Hills I'll Lift Mine Eyes, after which I'd like to bring Wes back to the mic to read in the book of Corinthians, chapters 4 through 6. So, To the Hills I'll Lift Mine Eyes, on page 95. Okay, if you'll all be seated, we will now turn the mic back over to Wes to read in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapters 4 through 6. Wes? Thank you very much, Dave. <clears throat> Chapter 4, Apostle of Christ. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it requires that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For you, who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? If and if you did not, if you did receive it, why do you boast although you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings, so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacles to the whole universe to angels as well as men. We are fools for Christ, but you are in no wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, 
we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the, the, the refuge of the world. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Jesus Christ, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I am sending you, Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Jesus Christ, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip? or in love with a gentle spirit, expel the immortal brother. Chapter five, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has been his father's wife and you are proud? Shouldn't you rather be have him filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship, the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as I would if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and is his spirit saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole bunch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. And that sentence is crossed out in my Bible. Must have been added. I have written you in my, my letters not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy, swindlers, idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, or a slanderer, or a drunkard, or, or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside God will judge those outside expel the wicked man from among you chapter 6 lawsuits among believers if any of you have a dispute with another dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints do you not know that the saints will judge the world as if you are to judge the world? Are you not com com competent to judge tri trivial cases? Do you not know that we are will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have dispute about such matters, appointed a judge even men of little account in the church. I say this to, to shame you. It is possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge 
or dispute between believers. But instead, one brother goes to law's law against another, and this is the front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will turn, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be, uh, do not be deceived? Neither the ex sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of, of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Sexually immoral, chapter 12, uh, verse 12, of verse, uh, chapter 6. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible to me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and my stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but the, but the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from death and he will rise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sin a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who it is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were brought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Wow. Laid it down, didn't he? Back at you, Dave. Thank you, Wes. You know, these words were inspired by Yehovah to be written down. And they are there for our teaching and our admonition. And we are not at liberty to pick and choose which ones we'll pay attention to and which ones we won't. And so many quote-unquote religious organizations today uh, take scriptures and just throw them completely out. And they, they embrace things that, uh, according to scripture, are abominable. And these are things that we need to be aware of because these scriptures, they are indicative of the mind of God. And as a result, we need to be, you know, working out our salvation in fear and trembling and fear of, of disobeying that word and living contrary to that word. So... Uh, just be wary, brethren, that, you know, we don't have that, that latitude to pick and choose what it is we're going to do um, and listen to from Scripture. Okay, if you'll stand one more time, <clears throat> we'll sing a hymn that comes from Psalm 130, titled, In His Word Have I Hope, which is 
found on page 99, after which we'll have uh, the main message uh, um, titled Pentecost in the Old Testament. Um, it's based on a work from uh, Samuel Bakayoki regarding the festivals of God. Uh, so uh, I think you'll find it quite interesting. Um, in the build-up to uh, Pentecost here, I thought it appropriate that we cover some background on Pentecost. So uh, we'll have Pentecost in the Old Testament after we sing our, our uh, fourth hymn, In His Word Have I Hope, on page 99. Well, that one's a little tricky, but uh, beautiful hymn nonetheless. So let me uh, share my paper here. Hopefully you guys can see what I'm sharing. Okay, so today's message is about Pentecost. And as I said, you know, we're building up to... Uh, we're starting the fifth week of the countdown to Pentecost. We're supposed to count seven full weeks from the wave sheaf offering, which occurs on the, the first day of the week after the weekly Sabbath during the days of Passover. Uh, Pentecost is the second of the three great pilgrimage feasts mentioned in Scripture that Israel uh, kept and that continues on in the quote-unquote Christian church, meaning it hasn't been done away with. But it does have some added meaning and function. Now, of course, the first pilgrimage feast is Passover, and the third is the Feast of Tabernacles. All three of these festivals are associated with the agricultural harvests of Israel. And Passover coincides with the barley harvest, the first of the grain harvests in Palestine. Pentecost is uh, associated to the wheat harvest festival, which occurs uh, seven weeks after the barley harvest. Both of these festivals are um, spring first fruits harvests, which came before the final fall harvest celebrated at the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, which was the fruit harvest. Since uh, harvest is, uh, in Scripture, typifies the ingathering of the redeemed, um, we'll see that these festivals were designed to reveal the unfolding of Yah's plan of salvation. The term Pentecost isn't found in the Old Testament. Uh, the feast was variously called the Feast of Weeks because it was celebrated seven weeks after the offering of the barley sheaf. We see that in Exodus 34, 22, <clears throat> where it says, You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. Also in Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 10, which says, You shall count seven weeks, 
begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put in the uh, put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to Yehovah your Elohim with tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you, you shall give as Yehovah your Elohim blesses you. Um, it's called the Feast of Harvest because it came at the end of the wheat harvest. Uh, we can see that in Exodus 23, 16, where it says, You shall keep the Feast of Harvest of the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather in uh, from the field the fruit of your labor. And also called the Feast of First Fruits, um, because it marked the beginning of the time of the first fruits of the wheat harvest were offered in the temple. And we can see that in uh, Exodus 34:22, where it says, You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. And also in Numbers 28:26, where it says, On the day of the first fruits, when you offer a grain offering of the new grain to Yehovah at your feast of weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do, uh, you shall not do any ordinary work. Now, <clears throat> in the New Testament, uh, the feast is known as Pentecost. It's a term that's derived from the Greek word Pentecoste meaning 50th, which is, uh, was widely used by Hellenistic Judaism um, and still used, I think, today. It's basically uh, the Spring Wheat Harvest Festival, a day of joy and thanksgiving when the Jews offered to God the first fruits of the land that uh, the land had produced. This festival could typify effectively the first harvest of the Christian church that occurred on the day of Pentecost when, as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 Jews accepted Jesus as their expected Messiah from Acts 2.41. As the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb and the exodus from Egypt foreshadowed the redemption from sin by the sacrifice of the true Paschal Lamb, so the offering of the first fruits at the Feast of Weeks pointed typically to the first fruits of the spiritual harvest of Christ's redemption that occurred on the day of Pentecost. And that spiritual harvest, um, really, you have Christ who was the wave sheaf, and then you have the wheat harvest, which, as we understand it, uh, is typical of the first resurrection, and then you have the second resurrection um, at the end of the year, or end of the thousand year period, right, um, with the remainder of the people being resurrected. Now, in ancient Palestine, the grain harvest lasted seven weeks, beginning with the barley harvest, as I said, right after Passover and ending with the wheat harvest seven weeks later. The time of the Palestinian barley harvest was the key to the Jewish religious calendar because Passover couldn't be observed until at least some of the barley was ready for harvest. Now, this, this is a common argument, right, with those that reckon their calendar looking at the barley, the ripening of the barley, and this is how the Karaites uh, deduce the timing of, of the spring holy days as well. Now, we understand that, you know, barley, depending on the weather, can come late or early. And we reckon the beginning of the year based on the lunisolar calendar, which uh, is exact. And so, you know, we, we don't follow that tradition that uh, the Karaites and some others carry on. The offering of the first barley sheaf took place on the day after Passover, 
This meant that if no barley was ready for harvest, the celebration of Passover had to be delayed by intercalating a month in the lunar calendar. And this is how they do it. This is how they reckon the beginning of the year and, and the Feast of Passover. Um, and since barley ripens a few weeks uh, before wheat, the ceremony of the barley wave sheaf offering the day after Passover marked the starting point of the 50 days countdown to Pentecost. Now, this term, Feast of Weeks, while used to designate the special festival day on which the first fruits of the wheat harvest were presented before Yehovah, actually refers to the entire period of the grain harvest of about seven weeks from the first cutting of barley to the completion of the wheat harvest. This is implied by the very name Feast of Weeks. That is a feast extending over seven weeks. Now that doesn't mean that we keep the feast for seven weeks, but it does imply that we should be doing something over these seven weeks. Um, however, the, only the beginning of the end of the 50 days were marked as uh, by a wave offering. Um, and this entire period was of special significance to the Israelites who were called to recognize God as the source of the early and latter rain that made spring and fall harvest possible. Um, and you can see in Jeremiah 5.24, it says, They do not say in their hearts, Let us fear Yehovah, our Elohim, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps, us, or keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. So it's a continual reminder that not only does he provide the, the rains in their season, but... Everything on this planet is his. And we are to be thankful for the fact that he allows us to utilize his creation for our benefit. The date of the Feast of Weeks was reckoned by counting seven weeks from the uh, first uh, putting of the sickle to the barley. Right, So from the first cutting um, of the barley, it says you shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the first time you put the sickle to the standing grain, which in this case was barley. We see that in Deuteronomy 16, 9, which says you shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time, from the, time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. The problem was to determine on which day the first sheaf of barley known as Omer was to be cut and presented as a wave offering before Yehovah. Now this determination was based on the instructions given to Israel in Leviticus 23, 15 uh, and 16, which says you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to Yehovah. Now, according to the text, the ceremony of the wave sheaf offering took place on the morrow after the Sabbath. From this Sabbath, seven weeks were counted to the Feast of Weeks. Since the term Sabbath is used to refer both to the seventh day of the week and to the annual feast mentioned in the same chapter, um, and you can see that in Leviticus 23, 8, 21, 23, 32, and 34. The question is, what is the meaning of Sabbath here? Um, seventh day of the week or a festival day? And this, this again is a point of contention and has been for thousands or hundreds of years. And, and it's important for us to get these days right. Now there's a reason the calendar has been corrupted. It prevents people from keeping the law of God as he intended, which is Satan's 
whole mission in life uh, is to prevent us um, from being able to follow what God says for us to do. So as I said, there are two methods of reckoning, or at least main methods. I'm sure others have figured out other ways to count or calculate when Pentecost should be. Uh, this question became an outstanding point of contention between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees interpreted the Sabbath as the festival day of Passover, Nisan 15, which is, you know, the first day of unleavened bread. Uh, and they waved the first sheaf of barley on the following day of Nisan 16. And from that day, they counted the 50 days to Pentecost. Now, the chief support for their interpretation comes from the Greek version of Scripture of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, that, uh, Leviticus 23.11, which says, The priest shall wave the omer on the morrow after the first day of unleavened bread. And you can see that of unleavened bread is in brackets. But in verse 15 of the same chapter, it reads, you shall count from the morrow after the Sabbath. The word Sabbath in Greek, when used by itself, can mean only the seventh day of the week, or uh, the week as a whole, but not an annual feast. Right? So when it says uh, just Sabbath by itself, it's referring to the seventh day of the week. In the Targum of Jerusalem, we find the same interpretation as uh, for Leviticus 23.11. After the first festal day of Passover, Philo and Josephus support the same tradition. Philo writes, within the festival of unleavened bread, there is another festival following directly after the first day. In a similar vein, Josephus writes, from the second day of unleavened bread, they count 50 days. In direct support, for this interpretation is also found in Joshua 5.11, where it says, And on the morrow after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes uh, and parched grain. And the manna ceased on the morrow when they ate of the produce of the land. The parched grain was obviously the fresh grain from the spring harvest that could be eaten only after the offering of the first sheaf of barley, right? Because you're not allowed to eat of the new harvest until after the wave sheaf. This suggests that the offering of the wave sheaf was made on the day after Passover or Nisan 16, which marked the beginning of the 50 days of the Feast of Weeks. And this has been the normative uh, Jewish tradition that has continued uh, even today. So this reckoning of the calendar uh, by the Pharisees fixed the day of, of Pentecost to Sivan 6. The Sadducees, however, Supported by the Bethusians, the Karaites, and the Samaritans took the word Sabbath to mean literally the first Sabbath that fell during the week of unleavened bread. And support for this interpretation comes from the fact that the word Sabbath by itself is never used in the Bible to refer to an annual feast. The Day of Atonement was designated by the compound expression Shabbat Shabbaton, usually translated as a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you can see in Leviticus 23, 32, it shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening. From evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. And then uh, in Leviticus 16, 31, it says, it is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. So that's Shabbat Shabbaton. And this means that they counted the 50 days from the first Sunday after Passover. So consequently, Pentecost for them always fell on the same day of the week, namely Sunday. 
Now, this method has the advantage of finding its counterpart in the quote-unquote Christian day of Pentecost, which occurred on a Sunday because it fell 50 days after Christ's resurrection, just prior to the first day of the week. So, you can see that in Mark uh, 16.2. It says, very early on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Now, he was already gone. And, and we've gone through this calculation before, um, where he wasn't risen on Sunday morning. Um, he had to be put in the tomb before the high day, uh, not the weekly Sabbath, but a Shabbat Shabbaton. He had to be put in the ground before, and he had to be raised before, because he was put in the ground on uh, Wednesday, just before dark, and he rose on Sabbath, just before dark. Uh, dark into the first day of the week. So he rose from the dead sometime between just before dark and when they came early in the morning before dawn. In Acts 2 verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Right? So they were there on the day of Pentecost, and that was the first day of the week. There's ample evidence that the calendar in use by the Jews is a corrupted version of the sacred calendar. We are aware of the, the postponement system that was put in by Rabbi Hillel II around, I think it was 325 AD or something like that. Uh, so the calendar has been changed. And what people observe today is not what was observed from the beginning. If Pentecost always falls on, on uh, Sivan 6, or this should say um, starts the count from Nisan 16 and always falls on Sivan 6, then why the Omer count? Why do we even need to count if we already know when it is? There is no need to count as because it's always on the same day. And the New Testament church were observing the Feast of Pentecost on the proper day which was the day after the weekly Sabbath that fell during the Feast of Passover and Leavened Bread. It's interesting to note that in the particular year of Christ's death and resurrection, the two different methods of reckoning concurred on the date of Pentecost. And this is because according to the Yoannim chronology of Jesus' death, Passover, Nisan 15, fell on a Sabbath and the offering of the wave sheaf on Sunday. This fulfilled the Pharisaic interpretation of Leviticus 23.15, which counted the 50 days from the day after Passover, Nisan 16. Amazingly, it also fulfilled the Sadducean interpretation, which counted the 50 days from the first Sunday after Passover. Pentecost, described in Acts 2, as we just read, fell on a Sunday for by both systems of computation. And... Who knows why that is? I mean, perhaps it's providential, perhaps not. Uh, but he appears to have fulfilled both interpretations in the year of his death and resurrection. Which at least is interesting to note. So the countdown to Pentecost began with the offering of the first barley sheaf known as the Omer on the day after the weekly Sabbath during the days of Passover. The ceremony was called the Sfirat Hamor, or Hamer. Um, I apologize to all of the Hebrew speakers out there. Um, and that is to say, counting of the Omer, because on that day, the Israelites began counting the 50 days to Pentecost. The purpose of the wave sheaf offering was to consecrate and inaugurate the spring grain harvest, which lasted about seven weeks until Pentecost. Uh, the ritual of this offering is described in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. In Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, it says, And Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, 
Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to Jehovah. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to Jehovah with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day. Until you have brought the offering of your Elohim, it is a statute forever throughout your gener generations in all your dwellings. So the cutting of the first barley sheaf entailed a lively ceremony. The sheaf was cut in the evening, put into baskets, and held until the next day. When it was brought to the temple, formerly perhaps local sanctuaries, to be ceremonially waved by the priests, right? So there was this big shindig that went along with this, this uh, ceremony. The Talmud states that a priest would meet a group of pilgrims on the edge of the city and from there lead them to the temple mount singing and praising God. And together with a priest they proclaimed, a wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt, into the place, and into this place, and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And this comes from Deuteronomy 26, 5 and 8 through 10. And we'll just read those very quickly here. It says, And you shall make response before Yehovah your Elohim. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And then in verses 8 through 10, it says, And Yehovah brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders, and he brought us into the place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Yehovah, have given me. And you shall set it before Yehovah your Elohim and worship before Yehovah your Elohim. So it's a joyous occasion, a time of thanksgiving for the bountiful harvest and the blessings that Yehovah gives to his people and the privilege that we have to utilize this beautiful creation that he made for us. Now, we have grossly mismanaged it. We don't observe the land Sabbath. We pollute it, and, and we strip it of its natural resources. And, and uh, at the risk of sounding like a radical environmentalist, we, you know, mankind has basically become a blight on this planet, like a plague of locusts, consuming everything in its path. And it's really shameful what we've done. And the day is coming when, you know, Yehovah says that the earth will enjoy its land Sabbath. So he will force that. Um, it's kind of interesting that he has to force us to do what's good for us. <laughs> because we will, we would basically consume and 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 fight our self right out of existence so when they arrived at the temple the priest would take the sheaves lift some in the air and wave them in every direction to acknowledge god's sovereignty over the whole earth before offering of the sheaves no reaping of the harvest for personal use could be done we see that in leviticus 23:14 where it says, and you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day, until you have brought the offering of your God, your Elohim. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It's a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It doesn't say it's a statute forever until the Messiah comes. 
It doesn't say it's a statute until you get tired of doing it. It's a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And that's, I can't read that any other way than still applicable to us today as it was to them when these words were uttered. Now a portion of the wave sheaf was placed on the altar and the rest was eaten by the priest. A male lamb was sacrificed as a burnt offering. Leviticus 23, 12 says, And on that day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to Yehovah. So what is the significance of this sheaf of first fruits? Now, most of us who've been around the churches of God for any time at all have a, a, an understanding of what this is, but it's good to cover this subject. Um, you know, repetition um, solidifies things in our mind, and a lot of times when we go over something more than once, we always glean something new out of it. So, uh, at, you know, even though we've covered this in the past, it's always good to cover it again. And the Bible attaches special significance to the offering of the first fruits or firstborn. Everything on the earth, including man and beast, was to be presented before Yehovah as first fruits to him. Exodus 13, 2, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and beast, is mine. And then in Exodus 22, 29, it says, you shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the overflow of your presses, the firstborn of your sons, you shall give to me. Now we know that the firstborn of Israel were redeemed by the priesthood. They took the place of the firstborn. The first barley sheaf was offered in the course of the Paschal week from Leviticus 13, 10 through 14. It says, and the priest shall look. And if there is a white swelling of, in the skin, uh, actually, I think that's the wrong verse. And I apologize for that. So, uh, but we covered that already um, in uh, up above. We know that uh, the sheaf was offered in the course of the during Passover. Um, it was offered at uh, the at the wheat harvest at Pentecost. It says you shall observe the feast of weeks in Exodus thirty four twenty two the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. It says you shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to Yehovah. I'm going to make a quick note of this as uh, something I need to fix. I apologize for that. Um, so the offering of the first fruits represented a human expression of thanksgiving and divine generosity, right? Because he gives us everything. Everything is his, and he gives it to us freely to utilize. And we are to be thankful for that fact. This meaning is clear in Deuteronomy 26.10, where the Israelites are instructed to bring some of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest and publicly to confess, Behold, now I bring the first fruits of the ground, which thou, O Lord, has given me. And the gift from God calls for a gift from his people. From Deuteronomy 26.10, it says, And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Yehovah, have given me, and you shall set it down before Yehovah your Elohim and worship before Yehovah your Elohim. So it's it's uh, it's our duty to properly follow 
Yah's instructions to us in terms of when we are to enjoy the fruits of not only our labor, but his blessing. So Philo, in his treatise on special laws, pages 179 to 181, deals with the different feast days. He explains the meaning of Pentecost with these words. This feast is called the Feast of the First Fruits because before the year's grain is used by man, the first produce of the new harvest and the first fruits are to be presented as first fruits, for indeed it is right and just. When we have received prosperity from God as the greatest gift, not to enjoy the most necessary food, which is at the same time the most useful and delightful, and not to appropriate it entirely to ourselves before having offered the first fruits to him who has given it to us. Not that we give him anything. For all things, riches and gifts belong to him. But because by this humble sign, we show an attitude of thanksgiving and of piety toward him, who is not sparing with his graces, but who extends them continually and liberally. So in spite of man's complete rebellion against God's way of life, and even denying the very existence of a creator, he still continues to provide the rains, and he still provide, provides the use of his creation, and watches as we run amuck on the planet and and make a mess of what he created so beautifully so you know we are we are to be ashamed of our behavior no doubt now the consecration of the first fruit sanctifies the whole harvest since the part stands for the whole as Paul puts it in Romans 11:16, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. So by the symbolic gesture of consecrating the first fruits, the whole of the harvest was consecrated to God. Just, you know, the same principle applies to the consecration of the Sabbath time, which represents the consecration of our total life to him. All he asks is a small portion. And as, as, as Philo said, we don't give him anything. We just give him back a portion of what he already gave us. Because we have nothing. And without him, we are nothing. So it's a small thing for us to give back the first fruits and a tenth of our, our increase. The idea that the consecration of a part exercises a sanctifying influence on all is applied in the Bible to the plan of salvation. Israel was holy to Yehovah, the first fruits of his harvest, because it was they're, they're called by God to exercise a sanctifying influence on all nations. It says in Jeremiah 2, 3, Israel was holy to Yehovah, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate it, ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares Yehovah. And he told Abraham, in, in your seed shall all nations be blessed. In Hosea 9, 10, it says, like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season. I saw your fathers, but they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they loved. So quickly we went astray. Similarly, as Christians, we are a kind of first fruits of his creatures from James 1.18 says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Because we are called to be a sanctifying influence in the world. 
just as parents sanctify their children. Those who arose from the dead at the time of Christ's resurrection became a type of first fruits. Uh, that is, the pledge of all those who will rise at the time of Christ's return. And we are all familiar with this story in Matthew 27, 52 and 53. It says the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints. Now, it wasn't just anybody that was resurrected at his death. It was bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And I mean, that's, can, I don't can you imagine people seeing these, these people coming out of the graves? That would have been something. Ephesians 4, 8 says, therefore it says when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. So he, these people received the gift of life and we can only speculate that they were, you know, they were allowed to live out some number of days and uh, then they, they died. Um, and they await a, a resurrection and translation just like the rest of us. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And remember, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, right? So there will be people alive, and I'm pretty sure we all hope that we're there, and we're part of them, um, at his coming. So for those, um, it says that will not proceed... Um, it says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we're, you know, we're standing there and all waiting for the resurrection. We see Christ returning. All of the dead saints rise up and they're standing there with us. Right? It says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, it doesn't say that, you know, you rise up and go to heaven. It says you rise up, meet him in the air, and he descends onto the earth. And we know that's where, where the government of God is reinstituted on this planet. The 144,000 saints who follow the Lamb are the first fruits for God and the Lamb because they represent the glorious destiny that awaits the redeemed of all ages. In Revelation 14, 4, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. More important still, I think, is the prophetic fulfillment of the first fruits offering by the resurrection of Christ. Paul specifically calls Christ's resurrection uh, the first fruits of those who will rise from the dead. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. And um, I'm only going to cover a few more minutes here. I know it's a little bit shorter than our normal service, but this paper is um, going to exceed 20 pages, so I don't want to try to cover it all in one sitting. I'm sure you'll all fall asleep, um, and I don't want anybody falling off the top tier, you know what I mean? 
So uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, it says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also came, or came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So in this passage, Paul speaks of Christ twice as the first fruits. And there are some that would argue that the church is the first fruits. But this clearly calls Christ the first fruits. Not only to indicate that he was the first to rise, uh, bodily from the grave, but also that by so doing he fulfilled the offering of the first fruits. We noted that the first sheaf of the barley harvest was waved before Yehovah by the priest as a pledge of the full harvest that would follow, and the ceremony was performed on the day after the weekly Sabbath during the days of Passover. And again in Leviticus 23 10 11 through 11 it says, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yehovah, so that it may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. The word Sabbath in these uh, verses is Shabbat, or Shabbat which is Strong's Hebrew Dictionary 7676. It's not... Uh, uh, and, and this word is used of the weekly Sabbath. It isn't Shabbaton from Strong's Hebrew Dictionary 7677, which is used of the high days. Two different words, and things get misconstrued and timing gets out of whack and you end up keeping days on the holy days at the incorrect time the wave sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest was a type of christ the first fruits or pledge right he's the down payment of the great harvest that will follow when all the righteous dead are raised at the second coming of christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, it says, But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 16. And, and remember, brethren, we belong to Christ. He redeemed us. We're not our own. As the bride of Christ, right? The bride of Christ is not her own. She belongs to her husband. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 16, it says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from uh, Yehovah, or from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Christ rose from the dead just before dark on the Sabbath, before the wave sheaf was presented in the temple. Right? It's the day before. He says, And you shall eat neither grain or bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until that same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And, and we've read that over and over in this study. But it's to impress upon you the importance of what's going on here. Luke 23, 56 says, then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. Right? And this was after he had been buried. And before he had risen. 
and then Luke 24, 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices they prepared. Now we know that when they got there, they found the tomb empty. So here they are, early before the sun came up, they show up and he's gone. So he wasn't, he wasn't raised Sunday morning at dawn. He was already gone. He was raised somewhere between dusk and dark on the Sabbath. Now, at, and, and we'll stop here at this last piece. Um, you know, the first sheaf, as I said, was a pledge and assurance of the ingathering of the entire harvest. So the resurrection of Christ is a pledge that all who put their trust in him and follow God's way of life will be raised from the dead. It's reassurance. He is the example, right? We have faith in God because he said, I will raise him in three days and three nights. And he did. And he said, all those whom I have given him, I will raise and he will. When Christ returns, all the dead saints who remain loyal throughout their lives will be raised up and uh, together we will be translated, as Paul said, in the twinkling of an eye into spirit beings and we will rule with Christ on this earth, uh, reinstituting his government reinstituting the sabbatical system, the Jubilee system. So it's a time that we look forward to, and it's a, a time of great significance because it really is um, not quite the culmination of the plan of God because that happens later when you have the new Jerusalem and everything is spirit and, and God the Father dwells with us. That's the true culmination, but this is a major event in the plan of God. And so uh, hopefully, uh, you know, this little study has been helpful, uh, thought provoking. Um, I plan to continue to evolve this study over the coming years and, uh, you know, make it more uh, in depth and more comprehensive. Um, and you know, obviously weed out the errors. Um, so uh, I appreciate your patience and your understanding as we continue to develop our understanding of the plan of salvation and the truth of God. Uh, we're all learning, as we know. Um, so uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. So with that, we will uh, close this main message. And we'll have our final hymn, which can be found, I do believe, on page 124. If you'll all stand and turn to page 124, we'll sing one of my favorite hymns, Yah Speaks to Us. It's a very beautiful hymn. After which, I'd like to call upon Jerry Shalesky to close in prayer. So page 124, Yah speaks to us.
Okay, powerful hymn and a day we all look forward to when we will be united with the Messiah, the Son of God, and eventually with our Father. So with that, we'll turn the mic over to Jerry Shalesky to close in prayer. Jerry? Uh, am I sounding okay, Dave? Yep, loud and clear. We have come before thy presence, Father, the Most High God, the Creator of the heaven and of earth, Jehovah of hosts. We give you the greatest thanks and appreciation in our, with great joy that thou art our Father and that thou will teach us and be merciful. And as we pray before thee and honor thee, that thou will hear our prayer as we seek thy face and pray in thy name, to thy name, in thy name of thy son, Yahushua. We thank you for being able to get together with people all over thy creation and spend this time with you. This Sabbath that thou has commanded that we spend with you. And we honor you by not doing our own and speaking our own words on this day. We thank you for this way of getting together and spending time with like-minded people. We thank you for the sun that warms the earth, that gives us the food that we eat, and the water that we drink and the air that we breathe. We pray, Father, as it be thou will, that thou would heal the servants of any unnecessary pain and sickness, now will keep them from harm's way, may their families abide in the shadow of thee, most high God. As, we, as the fourth week of the Omer count is coming to a close, Father, we honor thee, and we ask you guide us and give us better understanding and correction. And we ask this all in the name of thy beloved Son, Yahushua the Christ. Amen.